ready to go. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Planning Committee. I'm Liz Schell. I'm the uh, Chair of Planning Committee, and our committee is Vice Chair uh, Councillor Neal, Councillor McLaren, Councillor Osanic, and Councillor Turner. And we have a wonderful component of city staff here tonight that I'd like to introduce to you. Um, I'll start behind me. We have Manager Vendetti, our Commissioner Hurdle, and our Director of Planning, uh, Agnew. And um, starting on this side, we have Planner Bolton and um, our uh, Nathan, Richard. Nathan Richard, who is the consultant. That was the word. Brown, 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 Brown. And Director of Brownfield Management and Environment. Quite a long, I'm just going to keep the titles very short. Director McClatchy. Uh, and in the background, we have our taxation manager, uh, director, uh, city treasurer, um, sorry, city treasurer Kennedy, taxation manager uh, Walker, and beside him, director Hugenboss. And planning staff on this side, we have our manager Newman, uh, planner uh, Eusebio, planner Sands, and planner Seathat. So we have a really good collection of staff who are ready to hear all comments, particularly since we have five public meetings this evening, so you will be well heard. I have, oh, and our clerk, of course, Derek O'Shea. Um, I have to read uh, every meeting when we have uh, public meetings and a notice of collection. Personal information collected as a result of this public hearing and on the forms provided at the back of the room is collected under the authority of the Planning Act and will be used to assist in making a decision on this matter. All names, addresses, opinions, and comments may be collected and may form part of the minutes which will be available to the public. Questions regarding this collection should be forwarded to the Director of Planning, Building, and Licensing Services. The purpose of public meetings is to present planning applications in a public forum as required by the Planning Act. Following presentations by the applicant, committee members will be afforded an opportunity to ask questions for clarification or further information. The meeting will then be opened to the public for comments and questions. Interested persons are requested to give their name and address for recording in the minutes, and there is a sign-in sheet for interested members of the public just outside in the hall. No decisions are made at public meetings concerning applications unless otherwise noted. The public meeting is held to gather public opinion. Exemption to this rule is outlined in bylaw number 2675 to delegate various planning approvals to staff and to adopt certain procedures for the processing of planning applications subject to delegated authority. Council has authorized staff to use discretion in determining if an application can be a combined public meeting comprehensive report to expedite the approval process. Information gathered at public meetings is then referred back to planning, building, and licensing services staff for the preparation of a comprehensive report and recommendation to Planning Committee. This means that after the meeting tonight, staff will be considering the comments made by the public in their further review of the applications. When this review is completed, a report will be prepared, making a recommendation for action to this committee. The recommendation is typically to approve with conditions or to deny. This committee then makes a recommendation on the application, applications to City Council and City Council has the final say on the applications from the City's perspective. Following Council decision, notice will be circulated in accordance with the Planning Act, and anyone with an interest in the matter may file an appeal. Interested persons are advised that if a person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions uh, before the bylaw is passed, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision of council to the Ontario Municipal Board unless, in the opinion of the board, there are reasonable grounds to do so. And with that, I'd like to open our first public meeting. And uh, this will uh, be an application from the City of Kingston, Community Improvement Plan Amendment. And uh, Ms. Bolton will introduce. Thank you, and good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee fellow staff and members of the community. Uh, we are here this evening to, pr uh, to uh, present the proposed changes to the city's Brownfields Community Improvement Plan, or CIP. Uh, the document was originally adopted in 2005 and has been amended a few times over the course of the last 12 years. Um, it, uh, staff are now proposing 
uh, some re revisions and an update uh, to the document and have actually recently presented information to Council uh, regarding proposed changes to the, the Brownfields program. Essentially, the purpose of the amendment is to update and make changes to the Brownfield CIP to reflect the way that the city intends to administer the Brownfields program uh, moving forward. So the amendment is being carried out in accordance with Section 28 of the Planning Act. Um, there is a section within the existing CIP which uh, does permit the municipality to make changes to the financial aspects of the program provided we don't go above and beyond the tax assistance and grants we were originally approved to provide. Um, however, we're using the formal amendment process um, because of the number of changes we're making, the changes to the length and format of the document, the fact that we want to take a look at the boundaries of some of the project areas, and essentially because at the end of the day, it's an open and public process that allows the community members um, to ask questions and provide their input into the process. Um, I just wanted to provide a point of clarification. Um, I have received a number of questions as to whether or not this amendment applies to uh, 55 Ontario Street, which is the former Marine Museum site. Um, so that application, there was a private uh, or another a separate application to amend the CIP for that site. Um, it was referenced in the public notice for this meeting because we are required under the Planning Act to say whether or not this amendment affects any other uh, properties. Um, I can say that, um, that that was not the point of this public notice. And in fact, that separate application to amend the CIP for 55 Ontario Street has actually been withdrawn. So the purpose of this amendment is simply to present the proposed changes that the city intends on making um, to the Brownfield CIP and to its Brownfields program moving forward. In terms of the objectives of the update and the changes that are being made, there are, there are three key ones. One is um, the applicability. So we want to ensure that we are maintaining incentives for those properties that we know there are, are significant environmental challenges. Um, there's the objective of efficiency. We want to improve the clarity and the predictability of the Brownfields program and to simplify uh, the implementation process as well as the document to a certain extent. And the third objective, of course, is affordability. So we want to decrease the financial burden on the municipality from future benefit payments while maintaining an, an effective incentive level. So we want to see the program continue and we want to do it in the most financially responsible way as possible. And we also want to update terminology that may have changed over the course of the last 12 years and take the opportunity to look at the existing project areas and whether or not they're reflective of any more up-to-date environmental information that we have. Um, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Nathan Richard, who is going to speak uh, in more detail about some of the specific changes proposed for the document. Thank you, Sonia. Um, my name is Nathan Richard. I'm the project manager for the Brownfields uh, program for the city of Kingston. And um, so I'm just going to go through some of the, you know, the, the details that we are going to look at changing and proposing to change within the CIP. Um, so we wanted to rewrite it for to improve the readability and the uh, the implementation of it, as it was um, some of the wording was a little bit cumbersome uh, in the previous in the uh, in the previous. Um, policy, so we wanted to update that so it's a little bit easier for people to understand. Uh, we want to create application packages that have implementation guides, so it's all kind of all in one. Uh, we want to provide a, a better process and clarification of the process for creating a new, um, a new project area within the CIP, because it's currently not really detailed out yet. And we wanted to renumber the project areas to make it a little clearer, um, just to make it a little easier for people to understand. And then we were going to do an adjustment of project area 1A boundary. So this is the, um, the map. Uh, so the, the brownfields could be in all of the urban area, but there's certain project areas within the city that are, would, you know, properties would be considered eligible. And so those are shown in the brown sections. Um, so we have areas 1A and B are kind of the, the bigger ones where the old industrial area was on the uh, kind of the east side of the city. And then uh, 1B was uh, Block D. And then we had uh, area 2, which is Williamsville, 3, which is uh, 223 Princess, and then 4, which is 700 Gardeners. 
And so this is one revision we are going to do with uh, project area 1A, and that's just to extend it out a little bit to encompass a little more of, uh, of the property down there to um, uh, just to look at some of the other you know, environmental conditions that do exist in that area, and there's a bit of intensification going on in that area as well with um, development of some sites. So we also want to, um, as Sonia had mentioned, we want to make sure that we're fiscally uh, putting a bit of rigor into the program as well. And so with that, um, we want to reduce the number of eligible and potential eligible properties. Uh, so one of the decisions that we have, uh, we're proposing is to no longer accept applications in, in the Williamsville area. Um, we felt that with the Williamsville urban, urban study that was done, and we overlaid the Brownfield program with it, that it's had a lot of interest from the development community. And um, the project area will still be there, we just won't be accepting applications. So that's where we've kind of mentioned that council at its sole discretion could potentially view projects in that area. Um, however, would be um, you know, potentially hesitant to, to continue to, to do projects there with the Brownfield program. Um, we wanted to reduce, again, uh, potential eligible properties, and that was uh, one of the ones was explicitly disqualified the use of the Brownfield program for uh, cleaning up federal or provincially uh, owned lands and recently divested by upper levels of government. And the details within that is if, if it was, um, has been or was owned 10 years previous to when it's been, somebody's applying uh, for brownfield funding. And another item was to reduce the total amount of tax rebate available to each brownfield project. So they, this was um, in consideration again about, you know, the kind of the, the fiscal rigor that we want to make sure that we're implementing in the program to keep it continuing as long as we can and, and provide, you know, as much funding as we can to uh, the properties that are, you know, have more issues than others. Um, so we want to reduce the percentage of eligible re rehabilitation costs from 100% to 85%. Um, and then we were going to remove some items that are eligible that really haven't been used much from the development community, or they were problematic to figure out exactly how to calculate the costs. Um, and some of those were financing, insurance, on-site infrastructure improvements, um, as rehabilitation costs as well. So the next one was to reduce the annual amount of tax rebate available to individual projects. And so this one instead of, so the way that it worked is that the tax increment that's produced by the redevelopment, 80% uh, of the municipal money would go back to refund or as a grant um, for the, to cover off the rehabilitation costs. So instead of the 80% of the tax increment, we're adjusting that to 70%. And 20% will still go to the, um, the Brownfields Municipal Reserve Fund. However, the other 10% will go into the city general uh, revenue. So it'll go into the regular tax base. And one other item that we wanted to do as well as we made these changes was preserve flexibility to deal with exceptional properties. And um, those properties would be the Davis Tannery, any properties that have been failed tax sale properties because Typically, they've been problematic to move along in the uh, development community, so they have significant issues. Um, former coal gasification lands and strategic municipal disposition lands. And another item that was only used on Block D and it had very specific circumstances um, was uh, exemption for development charges and impost fees. Um, as, as time has gone on, we've uh, the city has realized and UK has realized that some of these projects are very intense and require um, a lot of funding to get good infrastructure in place and they're very complex projects as we've seen on, uh, on Princess Street and items like that. Um, so we wanted to explicitly kind of take that out of, uh, out of the equation. Um, but I think this is where Sonia was going to pick it back up and just explain the process, um, kind of where we are today, and then the rest of the process that will follow for the uh, changes to the CIP. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, so there was a report to Council back on June 20th, which actually uh, explained 
uh, the proposed changes. And at that point, uh, council provided direction to staff um, not only to undertake this formal amendment process, um, but also to hold on any decisions for funding applications or new or expanded project areas within the community improvement plan until these changes um, are in place. Um, so this evening, of course, we're having the, uh, the formal public meeting. Uh, there was a notice, the statutory notice was published in the Whig Standard 20 days in advance of the meeting. Um, now, since the time that that public notice uh, was published, um, we have also been taking a further look at the project areas, and there's been the proposal to make that adjustment to project area 1A. So unfortunately, that wasn't captured in the initial public notice and the mapping that was in the notice in the newspaper. So we will need to do um, a second, a second uh, public meeting potentially in combination with our comprehensive report at a future date, but certainly um, at this public meeting, because we have presented it tonight for those that are here and that wish to comment and that have um, questions or comments about that addition to Project Area 1A, we're certainly happy to receive that feedback now uh, for consideration. Um, in terms of inquiries, we've received a number of inquiries to date, mainly just questions about what are the nature of the changes that we're intending to make, um, as well as a number of uh, questions of clarification as to uh, whether 55 Ontario Street is part of this or not, which I've, I've stated is that it is not and has actually been withdrawn. Private application has been uh, withdrawn. Um, so at this point, thank you for your attention. We're certainly happy to answer any questions at this point that, uh, that you may have. Thank you very much. Councillor Neal. Yes, a uh, couple of questions, not surprisingly, about Williamsville. Um, I've, I've said this to uh, some of you before. Williamsville, to date, has benefited, in fact, from this pl program. Um, I like to call it a light, light brown fields because they're gas stations with some leakage from tanks. So they aren't the heavy metal uh, chemical toxins that are in other areas. Uh, so, although there was, I understand, a dry cleaning operation up uh, farther up on in the in the district, is there an opportunity for a site-specific application within the Williamsville corridor? if indeed uh, it is found to be more severe than the light brown fields that we seem to be uh, dealing with so far. And is, am I correct in my understanding that the city used to pay for the assessment and that now that will be on the developer's dime? Who would like to take that? Ms. McClatchy? You, Madam Chair, um, the intention with the amendment with respect to the Williamsville project area is to not receive any more uh, applications for brownfield financial benefit from that area. That being said, the project area will remain so that we can continue to administer the, the uh, agreements that we have in place there. Um, but we do recognize that, as you mentioned, there may be uh, an occurrence where somebody does come forward with an exceptionally contaminated property that we're not aware of. In that situation, there is an opportunity, there, or there would be an opportunity to accept that application, but it would have to be with council's approval. So it wouldn't be an as of right, but we would, uh, we would evaluate the, the request from the developer and bring a recommendation to council whether or not to proceed with accepting an application. Thank you. And um, there are three current developments uh, that are in front of the OMB, but they've gone through the process or they've begun the process. If those developers had formally requested and applied for Bramfield assistance, will they be grandfathered in or will they uh, not be able to access uh, any of that assistance? Through you, Madam Chair, those applications have been made to the city and accepted and approved by council. So as they wind their way through the OMB, they still have approved um, agreements in place. So we'll, we'll honor those agreements, of course. Thank you. Um, and go, going back to Ontario Street, um, I appreciate and I support the idea that uh, property tax 
taxpayers shouldn't be paying for provincial and federal uh, sites that have been polluted. If a private developer purchases provincial <coughs> or federal property that's at risk, can I assume that that means that um, that they're responsible for their own due diligence and the city uh, would not support a specific uh, application for those sites that were formerly provincial or federal? With the revisions to the CIP that are proposed, um, we would not accept applications for any property that was uh, recently divested by either provincial or federal governments or their agencies. So that would be a, that would be a notice to potential purchasers of the, those properties that they should do their due diligence and understand their environmental liabilities and understand also that the city is likely not in a position to provide financial benefit. That's another correct answer. Thank you very much. Councillor McLaren. Thank you. Um, during the presentation, I heard something that I, miss, I need clarification on. I heard that this is going to decrease the financial burden of future benefit payments. Um, I was under the impression that uh, we don't actually pay developers anything and that we defer costs to them, like future tax liabilities. Isn't, is, how much of a future benefit payment do we normally supply? Through your Madam Chair, um, the uh, some of the, some of this relies on the timing of, of when the developments actually occur. Uh, but there has been some concern that um, you know if some of these projects come online all kind of in similar years. There'll be a, a, a substantial payments that will go out to to the developers for these uh, for these grant payments, and it starts to impact uh, cash flow within the city. Um, so some of the things that this will do is, is remove about, um, so with the changes to the, if we go from 100% to 85% um, rehabilitation costs of what we believe to be a forecast of future, of future uh, brownfield applications, um, we see a change of about 4.3 million. Um, so from 14, almost 14 and a half million to, to say 10 million. Um, that's the change that we would see from that side of the equation. And then also from the municipal tax increment going from 80% to 70%, we would see a change of about, um, uh, let's see here, $840,000. So it's, it, it all adds up. And there's, that's, that's considering uh, 12 projects that we believe would come forward. So these are payments that the city actually transfers money, cash to? A developer to build or to develop a yes. particular. Yeah. So essentially, what happens is they'll they'll pay their taxes once once the development is done. They pay their taxes, and then the city will each year will rebate them back eighty percent of the municipal taxes to to cover off the cost for the rehabilitation. So it is it is money that the the city will provide back to the developer. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, that's okay. I was under the impression that. Um, that would be money that we wouldn't have collected in the first place if it had not been developed. So is this an increase? Uh, we're facilitating an increase and we're returning a portion of that increase, but not, in, not from the original undeveloped tax amount? So through you, Madam Chair, yeah, that's, that's correct. Um, if a property was to sit vacant, it would be subject to a vacant property tax, which would be minimal. Uh, it's only when the pro when a brownfield property is redeveloped and it's reassessed and it's subject to a higher property tax rate um, that the benefit to the city arises such that we are able to rebate um, paid property taxes back to a developer until they can recover their eligible remediation costs. So it's it's money that's it's money that's gained by the city through through uh, tax increment but then a portion of which is rebated back in a period of time. But then after that period of time is over, um, 
we recover the full amount of the tax increment. Okay, so I'm um, just one more little clarification. Um, we are always benefiting from this, aren't we? Is there any detriment at all? Like when we say future tax benefits, that's from a larger sum of money. Through you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, we're always benefiting from it, but the issue becomes one of if there's a certain amount of growth that's gonna happen within the city um, to account for you know, increases in population and so forth, that growth is gonna happen. If it happens only on brownfield sites, then we're put in a financially stressed position because we're having to rebate a lot of that expected uh, taxation growth through the brownfield program. If it were to happen only on greenfield sites, for instance, where there is no brownfield program, then we would recover the full amount of that tax increment, we would be in a better financial position. So um, the revisions in the CIP try to strike a balance there. Okay, so this is essentially, we've privileged brownfields over other non-polluted, and it seems that more developers are going towards this as a result of that. Is that part of the reason for the rebalancing re of these percentages? Part of the reason for the rebalance of these, of these percentages has to do with the fact that there's a 10-year window of taxation, of potential taxation rebates that any given brownfield property can, can use to recover their eligible remediation costs. And what we've seen in our experience since 2005 is that um, the average rebate period being used is about six and a half years. Um, ideally, we would like that to be 10 years. So if we adjust the eligible remediation cost levels and the, and the percentage of incremental tax that can be rebated back, we can shift that average to something closer to 10 years. Wonderful, I think that's clear. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the committee? Then I'd like to open the floor to any members of the public who would like to comment. Um, we have a microphone on this side, if you'd like to come to the microphone and uh, give your name and address. And uh, yeah, um, there's a gentleman on this side. Um, Mr. McClatchy will turn on the microphone for you, and uh, we'll uh, gather up all the questions and opinions, and we'll have staff answer them all at the end. So, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, City Councilors and staff. My name is Adam Coven. Uh, I live at 480 King Street West. Uh, my family uh, owns Rosen Energy Group, uh, of which possesses the property at 5 and 7 Catarockway Street. Um, as such, also owned 323 uh, Rideau Street and the right-of-way between it for the Re Wellington Street extension. Um, we, we negotiated in, a, in, a, in good faith with the city and uh, sold for the Wellington Street extension the railway that we had purchased to amalgamate our two properties. Uh, and the city graciously agreed to purchase the broom factory, but also uh, got us into the um, initial study grant of which we've been negotiating for the last few years with various developers um, that would like to take the remaining three and a half acre parcel uh, into a residential uh, development. And at present, we actually have offers and are working with developers now. Um, I'm hoping that we would also be thought of as an exceptional property. I'm sure you're not, you're not unused to people saying that they're exceptional and different than their neighbor. Um, but our neighbor happens to be you at this point. Um, the reduction in size was, uh, I felt, compensated well uh, with city staff and uh, council had worked with us and it seems to be a development that can go forward. But in negotiations at this point, this type of change I think would, well, I, I have been told by several that I've spoken to, that it would stop the process, that we would lose these uh, potential developers. Um, so I, I think that be, because of the circumstance, because we already were in the initial study grant, we actually withdrew um, believing, and, and maybe it is true, but believing that there's a, a better process for us to withdraw and reapply, um, had no knowledge that there would be a reduction um, in the, in the uh, CIP. So we've been negotiating good faith with other developers. What I'm asking for the planning committee is to consider 5-7 Cataraqui Street as a wonderful potential development. Um, that we have been going down this road several times with developers on the basis of the original numbers and that hopefully that we can be a strategic brownfield site uh, as an exceptional property as stated in point five. Um, I state this only because the 
disposition of some of our lands and the ongoing negotiations base itself. And thankfully, we've had wonderful uh, cooperation with public, uh, with city staff that have helped us greatly in the process. So we feel we're so close to the brass ring where we would see people living, you know, where my grandfather had oil tanks. It would be lovely, lovely to see uh, windows and people living down there. Um, but I think this would really uh, set us back several years in our, in our uh, negotiations. So I would ask that you would consider this as an exceptional property as well. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dixon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Frank Dixon, 485 Alfred, apartment two, K7K, 4J4. I did read the report online, and thank you for the presentation and the answers so far. Uh, very informative and very thorough. I'm very impressed with the high quality of work that's been done. Um, I do want to follow up on what Councillor Neal was talking about um, concerning Waynesville. Um, I do live there and I walk uh, on Princess frequently and it's in a state of change right now. We've had the um, grand study that's been done and then there's been developers that have come in and there are applications in process and they're at the OMB and, and so forth, right? So, I would say, my own opinion is, I would be against the changes that would be applying to Williamsville. I think Williamsville still needs um, attention as a neighborhood seen as a whole, and I think that the changes you're proposing may impact in a negative way the future redevelopment. You do uh, reference the chance that council can make an exception for, um, possible developments that are there. And as Councillor O'Neill was saying, we may be finding out that there's more in the way of serious brownfields than we know about at this stage, right? Um, you did talk about the Davis Tannery as being a sort of a special area. And I'm gonna pose a challenging question right here. Um, this is a, a site you know, that I have very high interest in. And I'm wondering, you might be able to comment uh, maybe not right now, but maybe in, in the report or, or later on, in a general sense that how would the changes you are proposing impact that site you know, specifically? And also taking into account that we have a special study area for the North Kingstown, this is the North Kingstown secondary plan, of which a lot of brown fields are contained within, right? So how are the changes going to impact the North Kingstown secondary plan work, if any changes. So again, a complicated question, um, perhaps you know, more information down the road, um, although I'd be grateful for anything that you can offer at this point. Okay, um, now just moving on. Um, there was a, a discussion on 55 Ontario Street property and then there's also debate offered by council on this point. Um, not to go into the history so much, but the city of Kingston did do a very thorough environmental assessment of that property when it was examining the possibility of purchasing it. That's a former federal uh, property, right? And um, reports came and they were debated and media covered it and public commented and so forth. So what I'm wondering is for that specific uh, property, does the city's analysis of the environmental rehabilitation that's needed and the costs associated with it still apply to any private developer that does try to take on a project there? Again, a, a, a question that's complicated, so maybe just put it on the record um, for answer uh, down the road, if not now. Um, I've got one question that I didn't see taken up in the report to the clarity I was looking for. And that respects to um, whether there are yearly quotas in place for CIP grants. Like, do you have a certain amount of money that, say, you can assign for 2017 and or 2018, and then once that's gone, then there's no more until the calendar year rolls over. I'm just sort of referencing um, the heritage property grants that they have um, uh, taken through the Heritage Kingston Committee, to serve as an example. There's a certain amount of money for the year, and then once that's gone, there's no more. So I'm just wondering if that kind of system is in place for this. 
And then I'm going to, uh, my final point is I'm just going to quote um, what Mr. McClatchy was, was telling to an event organized by former Councilor Downs in 2012, talking about Block D. And I mean, what was said at that time was that the Block D projects got a tax ramp um, release or kind of a, a break on their taxes for a certain amount of time over a t the 10 year window that you were just talking about. And then when that comes off, the annual tax revenue for the city is in the neighborhood of $10 million. So that's what I remember from that event. It was about five years ago. Um, so that really got my attention. And, and what it, it did was it showed me the power of the city's work on this. And I want to praise city staff and council for their leadership on this program. It's uh, really important to see that and to see the level of um, of effort that goes in and research. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone, yes, please come to the microphone. Uh, I'm Kevin Shipley. I live at 191 Churchill Crescent. Um, I'm an environmental consultant in town. I. Uh, uh, as my clients, I have a number of uh, people who are uh, uh, developers uh, who have uh, tapped into this program, and it, it's been a very, uh, a very useful program for many of my clients, and it has enabled them to uh, proceed with a number of developments. Uh, so, I, you know, I also uh, applaud city staff for having brought this program in. I have several con concerns about the changes that are, um, are being planned. Um, I guess one, one concern I have is uh, just in, in terms of the general uh, reduction in uh, the funding that will be provided. Um, they aren't drastic changes, um, but nevertheless, I think it will impact some of my clients. Um, it may, uh, I think in some cases, uh, cause uh, developers to back off from uh, developing some of the brownfields. Some of the brownfields may sit there longer before anything happens with them. So that's a general concern I would ha have with it. Um, now, some properties uh, have been uh, designated as uh, exceptional properties. Um, and um, my understanding of what that means is that um, they will um, be funded at the level of the current program, and Davis Tannery is one of those, and I would agree that it, it fits into that category. Um, but I guess a question I have is, is, um, how is, how is that decision made as to what an exceptional property is? And is there an opportunity for um, a client or a developer to come forward and say, uh, I think my property is an exceptional property. Is there, is there an application process for that? Uh, is, it, is it a decision that's made sp strictly by city staff? Or is it something that can be, uh, an argument can be made for a property to be considered exceptional and funded at the, um, at the current level? Um, I was also wondering if there's uh, a mechanism for um, appealing decisions that are made under the program. Um, I'm not clear on how that would work. If a property is turned down for um, uh, the, the, the BIF tip and the TERGIP funding under this program, uh, is there any kind of appeal process for that? Um, so that would be a question, and I'm not sure if that's addressed in here. And then the last comment I have relates to um, the report, um, and I'm, I'm looking at page 27 uh, of the report, and this is in section 6.2 of the revised uh, Community Improvement Plan document. Um, and this has to do with the sliding scale approach, uh, which has been previously, I think, approved by City Council for application. And basically, my understanding of the sliding scale approach 
is that um, in order for a property to be approved under the program, uh, the city will look at various aspects of that property and, uh, and essentially um, evaluate the property in, in terms of its um, uh, eligibility for the program. Um, looking at things like, for example, um, whether the property has been sitting unused for a long period of time, um, how much environmental liability it has compared to its value. Uh, but one of the things that I'm concerned about in this is um, item D on page 27, uh, right near the end of section 6.2, um, indicates that the city is going to consider whether recent real property transactions may have already discounted a site's environmental liabilities. So my understanding of the way this would be applied is that, for example, and it's probably easiest to illustrate with an example, if a, if a, a developer had purchased a property for $1 million and the city made a judgment that if that property had been clean, its value would be, let's say, $1.5 million, the city would be looking at that and saying that property has been discounted by a total of $500,000. So if the cleanup cost of that property was equal to $500,000, my understanding is that the city might, in that case, decide not to approve the funding because the city would judge that the property has already been discounted, that the de developer has already essentially got the funds to undertake the remediation because the developer only had to pay uh, $1 million when the clean value of the property is 1.5. Um, my concern with that is that there's more, uh, there are more costs that a developer could potentially incur in remediating a property than just the dollar amount of the remediation. If there's a, for example, a, a remediation required and it's going to be $200,000, but there's also a risk assessment required and it's going to be $150,000, and there's environmental site assessments and they're going to be $150,000, that adds up to $500,000. But the concern I would have is that you, you have to take into account other factors as well. If the risk assessment, for example, is going to take two years, um, and that means that the development of the property is going to take a year longer than it otherwise would have if it had been a greenfield site, that delay also has to be built in as well and considered. And I'm not sure whether that is something that the city will be considering in looking at this discount, because sometimes a one-year delay in bringing a property to the point of being developed and being able to start collecting the revenues from the, uh, the rents that are being charged and so on, um, sometimes that delay might cost the developer another $500,000 in the loss of that rent, uh, in the carrying cost of the property, and in other, in other aspects. So, I think this makes it somewhat problematic to implement. Uh, it's very difficult to kind of quantify some of those costs. Um, and so I, some of my clients have concerns. It's difficult when you are looking at buying a property um, and you want to use this program. 30 seconds, please. But you don't know, uh, you don't know how um, that th this provision is going to be applied. Uh, and th those are all my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other? Oh, please come to the microphone. Hi, my name is Kathleen O'Hara. I live at 91 King Street East, quite close to 55 Ontario Street. Um, first, thank you for clarifying our our questions about why the application for Brownsfield's designation regarding 55 Ontario Street. We were wondering why it was in the notice. So thank you. But I just want to make sure you say that it, it, the um, Brownfield's designation won't apply to 
recently divested federal and provincial property. Would that apply to 55 Ontario? What does recent mean? And third, um, I didn't, a few of us didn't see the map of um, the, the extension to project area 1A. Could we see that again? Because it was flashed on so quickly that we couldn't see what it meant. When they answer the question, sure. we'll get them to uh, bring it up and explain more fully what Thank the, you. Uh, the size is. Thank you. And are there any other members of the public who wish to comment? As we'll be getting the, uh, our uh, city staff to give a comprehensive list of answers to all your questions and comments. Seeing no other people, um, I would, sorry. Thank you, and your microphone is on, so okay. please go ahead. Um, I am Dr. Rhea Wood. I live at 64 Ontario Street, directly opposite 55 King Street. Obviously, I'm very concerned about what is going to be happening across the street to the Marine Museum, to the heritage values, um, and even if the surrounding area is a brownfield, I wonder how much deliberation is being given to other aspects of properties that are picked as brownfields. According to what the city itself has stated about brownfield program, that's intended to um, be beneficial to the community, not only in generating jobs and further expanding the tax base, but also in improving the community, contributing to substantial sustainability and make it a more desirable place for people to live <clears throat> and operate businesses. I do not see that the kind of project that is being suggested, being built next to the Marine Museum, would make the area there more desirable to live in. Quite the contrary. That's it, thank you. Thank you. Last call before we have staff uh, comment on all the questions and, and uh, concerns. Okay, thank you. I'd like to hand it over to staff to uh, start the response. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think I've captured most of those. Um, with respect to the property at 5-7 Cataraki Street, uh, it, it is still within a uh, project area of the Brownfield CIP and would still be eligible to apply for Brownfield benefits, including initial study grants. Um, with respect to uh, how the revisions being proposed to the CIP would affect the tannery, um, they, would, uh, they would not have a, a large effect on the tannery. The tannery is identified as a strategic project, so would be eligible to apply for benefits at the existing benefit levels. The only change I would note is that the, uh, the um, potential for receiving um, development charge and impost fee exemptions would be removed. So that's removed across the board. Um, there was a question about whether the city's environmental work done on 55 Ontario Street would apply to a new developer. That environmental work was done for our purposes in considering uh, how we would manage our interest in that property. Any new developer or any new purchaser of that property should do their own uh, due diligence and their own assessment of the environmental conditions there. There was a question about the amount of grant uh, funding available annually to uh, initial study grants. That remains the same. We budget uh, $60,000 a year for that purpose. Uh, if, it gets, if it all gets used in one year, it all gets used. Um, that hasn't stopped us from coming back to council. Well, we've never, I don't think we've ever done this, but we've always said that we would come back to council if additional applications were, were submitted and we were in danger of exceeding that. Uh, so the council could consider whether or not to free up additional funds, but that's rebudgeted every year. Um, ba -dum -dum. How is the definition of, an ex of a strategic property made? Um, we evaluated uh, that based on 
an understanding of properties with severe environmental uh, issues, and we know those to be um, the tannery, we know those to be the Block 4 property, which is a former coal gas gasification property, but we also included properties that were in the municipal interest to see, uh, to see incented for redevelopment, so failed tax sale properties and, and uh, properties subject to municipal disposition. Uh, there was a question about whether there's a uh, mechanism for appealing a funding decision with respect to a brownfield application. There is not. And I, th unless I'm incorrect, I think that was all the questions. Through you, Madam Chair, I would just add a couple of things for clarification. So certainly there were some detailed questions asked tonight that we will uh, address in our comprehensive report, which will come back to the committee at a later date. Um, in addition to um, Mr. McClatchy's comment with respect to uh, appealing decisions, so there is no appeal mechanism within the CIP. However, um, the amendment itself that is being proposed to the CIP, uh, that is a change under Section 28 of the Planning Act, and there, there are it is appealable, so there are, there are those provisions within that section of the Planning Act um, that amendments to the CIP can be appealed, but once the CIP is in, a place, in place, the decisions with respect to the individual applications under the program um, are not appealable. Um, there was also a question with respect to um, how the proposed changes would affect uh, not only the Davis Tannery, but the, uh, the larger North Kingstown secondary plan. One of the things that um, we're doing through this, which is a minor change, but we're um, renumbering some of the project areas, basically to highlight that project areas 1A and 1B were the original project areas for the Brownfield CIP, essentially because we know that those are the areas with the most um, historic industrial activity to it. Essentially, it was work that happened at a time when there weren't environmental regulations in place, and there's really nobody left to blame. So they, they not only do a lot of, not a lot, but some of those properties potentially have serious contamination issues. There's no one left to hold responsible for the cleanup. So it's, um, I guess it's an issue of uh, short-term deferral of increased tax revenue to see the long-term gain of not only the environmental cleanup of some of these significant properties, but also, also the long-term um, tax revenue uh, for the city as well. Thank you. Um, I think th there was a question about a discount method of sale for brownfields. I don't know if you wanted to address that or if um, some of these might be addressed more personally to uh, Planner Bolton. Um. Through you, Madam Chair. Sorry, I missed that one. Um, that's a question with respect to using the sliding scale approach and determining whether or not a recent property sale is already discounted an existing environmental liability. Um, this is relatively new ground for us. We've done it on a few projects, and the method that we use is we is we lean towards an appraisal method. So uh, we did we try to determine that fair market value of a property through an appraisal, and then compare it with the actual purchase price, and then compare that with uh, an applicant's. Um, estimate of what their remediation costs are going to be. So I think to be fair, we're not looking at 10 or 20 percent differences here. We're looking for much larger differences. Great. Thank you. Ms. Uh, so just further to, I believe there was also a question from a lady across the room with respect to um, what um, recently divested meant with respect to federal and provincial properties and, and the reference to 55 Ontario Street. So what's proposed in the changes is a, is a period of 10 years. So, so either currently owned by federal provincial government or recently divested within the last 10 years is how it's currently defined within the proposed changes. And it had, there was a question about um, the expansion to Area one, uh, 1A and so I guess there was the opportunity, they didn't have the opportunity to see the additional properties. I don't know if there was additional questions or clarification needed with respect to the addition. Um, I, think, I think it's Wellington Street from what I can tell and the, is it Johnson? It's I just can, the streets aren't I can speak to that. That is the, oh. through you Madam Chair, that is at the corner of Queen and King. So that would be the southwest corner of that intersection. And uh, we took the opportunity under the CIP revision to expand the boundary of project area 1A because of 
recent development activity in that area, we've become aware of environmental information that that leads us to uh, imply that that area is in a similar situation as the as the properties that are inside the current project area boundary. I believe that's one of your our coal gasification areas. Possibly. It's it's uh, it's certainly close to it. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Neal. Yes. Um, just seeking some clarity because I. I think I wanted to hear an answer. I'm not sure I heard that answer in <laughs> my first questions. Is it possible, uh, is it only in the CIP areas that uh, applications can come from, or will there be some consideration given to a site-specific uh, property that otherwise would qualify with all the criteria? Through you, Madam Chair. Um, a property has to be within an approved project area of the CIP in order to be eligible to apply for financial benefits. If a property is outside of an approved project area, they have the ability to apply to create a new project area or expand an existing project area so that they become eligible to apply. And we've seen that for projects like 700 Gardeners Road and 223 Princess Street. 700 Gardeners Road, that's the former uh, Nortel, right? That was gonna be my next question. So um, do, we, do we have an opportunity to decommission certain CIP areas? I'm not suggesting that for Williamsville, but for instance, Block D is now fully developed, I believe. Uh, with uh, that approval, if it remains as a CIP property designated area, could the owners come back at, with an infill proposal and tap into the program again? Through you, Madam Chair. Um, with, if the project area remains in place, Property owners have the right to make an application for additional financial assistance under the under the Brownfield program. Of that being said, I believe they extensively cleaned up the property the first time around. I sincerely hope you're right. Thank you. Any further questions from the committee? Seeing none, I will close this public meeting and thank you very much. Um, with a reminder that Ms. Bolton is the planner on file and you can ask questions of uh, city staff and Ms. Bolton. Thank you. I'll open uh, public meeting number two and this is a request for a zoning bylaw amendment, um, address 66 Earl Street. And we will have a presentation. Fantastic, thank you. All right. So, full screen? Yeah. There we go. Oh, that's, that's too full. That's All right, then. All right. So my name is Stacey Kimberly. I um, submitted this application on behalf of my employer, uh, the homeowner of 66 Earl Street, uh, Mark Peabody. Uh, what he is hoping to do is create a secondary unit in the basement of this apartment, uh, something that's in line with the city's plan to create more affordable housing. And uh, that, uh, doing that such will uh, uh, adhere to the popular, the density of the bylaw of 69, um, 69, this will actually be a population density of 68, so it should be okay. Uh, the only issues, we have four um, uh, issues with the not complying with the bylaw, which we uh, missed by not, not quite a lot. But uh, so um, to start with,
full screen again. There we are. Uh, this is the plot plan, and uh, it is our hope not to have to alter the exterior of 66 Earl Street at all, as it is a heritage property. Uh, so we're seeking relief from bylaw 5.3 BH, which prohibits uh, parking in tandem in a B zone. Uh, so to um, allow the uh, tandem parking in this case would provide the necessary one parking spot per unit and allow uh, us to keep the beautifully finished driveway. Oh. we have here uh, as you can see it's it's finished it's paved um, and it's quite long so uh, we can accommodate the two parking spaces in tandem uh, the second relief in regard to parking would be um, to the reduction of the minimum parking space width from uh, 2.74 meters to 2.66 meters uh, it's a difference of about three inches uh, to provide the uh, mandatory one meter walkway from the street to the entrance of the secondary suite, which is at the rear of the building. Uh, uh, yeah, so as you can see, all the space is currently being utilized, so there's no way to expand it. Uh, so the other... So uh, as we hear, uh, this is a mock-up of the uh, cross-section of the proposed development uh, in regard to uh, cellar habitation, which is prohibited by the bylaw. Um, as you can see at the rear of the building, uh, where the entrance is, we um, are above the 50%, which defines a cellar in the bylaw, but at the front, due to the incline of the grade, uh, we we do not meet the necessary 55 or 50 percent of upgrade. Uh, so um, we feel that the uh, so we're seeking relief from the seller uh, prohibition. Uh, we feel this deficiency is counteracted by um, the fact that we've actually exceeded exceeded the Ontario Building Code standards for um, light and ventilation in a basement dwelling, just through the use of the doors and windows. Uh, so we don't feel the quality of life of a tenant would be impeded. And uh, the final um, indoor amenity height, uh, which we do have enough space for the amenity, uh, but the uh, bylaw does require a seven foot ceiling, uh, which we have missed by about two inches. We have six foot 10 ceiling, uh, which does um, uh, adhere to the Ontario Building Code's minimum ceiling height, six foot 10. Uh, yeah, so those were the uh, the four that we had. Uh, questions? <laughs> Thank you very much. Questions from the committee? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Sands St from staff. No problem, through you, Madam Chair. The application was noticed as per the requirements of the Act, um, which included circulation to 136 properties in the surrounding 120 meter radius. There was notice provided in the WIG standard, um, and there's also signage posted on site um, to date, there's been two pieces of correspondence received, one in the form of a telephone inquiry, um, more so seeking uh, a warning uh, to the applicant in terms of flooding, um, which has been relayed from staff onto the applicant, uh, and the second uh, in the form of writing, which I believe has been attached to your package tonight as an addendum, um, seeking further information regarding council's decision on this application when we get to that stage. Thank you. Thank you. Questions from the committee? Councillor Neal? Just very quickly, is it currently uh, ha habit, uh, you want to make it into habitable space or it currently is habitable space? I believe we're working on finishing it, um, but uh, this was just uh, to make it a secondary suite so it would be available to rent. Um, I, I can't speak to what's been done there. Uh, okay. Yeah. It, it isn't currently inhabited, is it? No one's living there. No. no. Okay. Not in the basement. <laughs> Thank you. So. Councillor Turner. Thank you. And through you, Madam Chair, I just have a quick question. I was a little um, curious about the entrance. Did you say it was at the back of the house? Yes. So how would they get there to the to enter? Um, here, I can uh, bring up the 
so right here is um, Earl Street and the sidewalk, and uh, just in blue, I've outlined the one meter pathway that okay. would go down alongside the parking spaces okay. and uh, down a, um, a stairwell. Now, if there's two cars in the driveway and it's a snowy, wintry night, will they still be able to get down to their backyard? They should be, yes, uh, with the one with the three feet. Um, should provide a shovel, I, but I believe they would be able. It just looks rather small, but I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, yeah, that's why I'm asking. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Other questions from the committee? I'd like to open the floor to any members of the public who wish to comment or have questions on this application. Mr. Worth, please come to the microphone. There's one right here, and if you'll just push the button on the uh, microphone when it turns red, you're on. Great. Yes, uh, my name's Ted Worth. Um, I live at 79 Wellington Street. Um, so in terms of seeing the, the property, I don't actually see it, though I do fall within the area to actually get a letter from the city. And sort of my concern is that we are talking of intensification of um, the, the living areas in, in the downtown. Some very positive things about that, some good things from the city. Uh, to, largely, I would say, though, it depends on if we do these buildings well. Um, so I do have, as a neighbor, I sort of think, well, if one place has an extra um, apartment and it's not built very well, it's only one. Um, but if it becomes a precedent and if we are establishing precedents with this one, um, that's my question. Are there precedents being set here that I should worry about in the next application? Or is, is this a one time and, you know, I don't actually see the property, so, you know, I don't have to worry. Yeah. Thank you. I will get the applicant to answer as soon as I know if, if there are other questions or comments. Seeing none, would you like to um, respond if you can, and then maybe we'll ask staff as well. I'm sorry, uh, could I just get a... It, it had to do with um, the intensification, and I think it also had to do with the quality of the building. How are you constructing this uh, apartment? Oh, uh, And I presume it's to code. Uh, of course, yeah, it'll be, it'll be uh, constructed to the standard of the OBC. Um, I believe the intention is to pour uh, beautiful concrete uh, finished floor. Um, no changes to the exterior would be uh, made uh, except for uh, perhaps two low profile lights along the driveway just to provide uh, security for any tenants that would be there. Um, I believe a backflow valve has been uh, in, is going to be installed prior to a tenant moving in there so uh, flooding wouldn't be an issue. Uh, is that... uh, Mr. Sands? Through you, Madam Chair, I'd just like to comment. I'm not able to comment on the quality of construction, um, but I would like to comment on the zoning and the ability of that to set a precedent. Um, every planning application is reviewed on its own merits. And for example, in this uh, existing zoning on this property is a B zone, which is a three to six family dwelling. So the permitted use of that zone permits more in terms of density than what the applicant is proposing. One and two family are contemplated and obviously permitted in that zone, they default to a provision. As you can see, the relief that is requested um, doesn't necessarily pertain to the density that is proposed. Um, so I would just echo that any other development application in the future in this neighborhood would be reviewed based on merits of, those own of that own zoning and the existing zoning on the parcel. Thanks. Thank you. And I'll go back to committee. Councillor Neal. Yes. Um, I, I assume that all work done up to date, you've had a building permit for that? Uh, we've redone the stairwell. Uh, we have a building permit for that. Uh, and yeah, we have a, I believe we have one in at the moment awaiting okay. uh, the approval. And just a quick question of staff. Um, before occupancy, will a city building inspector have an opportunity to make sure that everything is built to code? Uh, 
Yeah, uh, we've been in communication with um, Ashley Osmer. Uh, she's been reviewing it. Mr. Sands? Yeah. yeah, through you, Madam Chair. Uh, most definitely. Um, once planning applications are approved, uh, this application is actually subject to zoning bylaw amendment for the, for the relief that was requested. It's also subject to site plan control as it's designated under the Ontario Heritage Act. Um, so once we're through with the Planning Act applications, the applicant will be then responsible to require an Ontario uh, building permit through our building division. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much for your presentation. And I will close uh, our second public meeting. And we have a third public meeting. Um, and this is to do with the uh, Tamarack Cataract Way West Corporation at 285 Holden Street, Woodhaven Subdivision, Stage 3, Phase 3, Application Zoning Bylaw Amendment. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of Planning Committee, staff and members of the public. Uh, my name is Yuko LeClaire. I'm a land use planner with Foten Consultants, uh, presenting this application for zoning bylaw amendment on behalf of Tamarack Cataraqui West Corporation and Bar Homes. Uh, our subject site is, uh, it's 285 Holden Street, but it's also known as Woodhaven Phase 3, Stage 3. Uh, it's in the west end of the city in the Cataraqui West master planned area, so it's also subject to the secondary plan there. Um, it's surrounded by primarily residential uses uh, to the west and south are existing residential uh, under development for the most part. Uh, to the north is a future, future residential and then to the east is an existing uh, commercial self-storage facility. So phase three of the subdivision uh, was draft approved back in 2013 uh, and it's undergoing final approval uh, in stages. So that's the technical review that allows the, the lots to actually be registered and built. Uh, final approval for phase for stage one is, is it's been completed for a number of years and that area is mostly built out. Uh, the developer is moving on to stage three, uh, sort of leapfrogging over stage two uh, as in order to accommodate some servicing considerations that are required now. There's a stormwater management feature that needs to be put in and some other servicing that needs, needs to get built out. Uh, and that dovetails a little bit better with the bar homes development to the south. And it's Phase stage three is undergoing the final approval process right now and it's fairly advanced uh, and it's that process that has triggered this application for zoning bylaw amendment. So what we're seeing that here is the current zoning on the subject site. Uh, Woodhaven phase three is subject to the R241 and the R242 zones which regulate the residential uses and then the OS16 zone regulates that stormwater management feature. Um, the, a, Residential zone in this subdivision uh, has sort of a legacy item that's, um, that is minimum lot area requirements and maximum lot coverage requirements. Now these are provisions that we don't typically incorporate in subdivisions in suburban areas that are municipally serviced anymore uh, because we have other tools and the city has other tools that it can use to regulate those servicing and amenity area considerations such as front yard or um, like the yard setbacks and lot frontage. So those provisions are unfortunately still in place and there's a number of lots here uh, shown in yellow that don't meet the minimum lot area consideration. They were not designed with that in, in, in mind. They were designed with the lot frontage and the yard setbacks, uh, but not with the lot area. Uh, so they don't meet those provisions. So they're seeking, we're seeking relief uh, to allow those lots to be built out. Um, we also have uh, two other components to this subdivision, uh, to this zoning bylaw amendment. Uh, the second is that, as happens often with uh, subdivisions, and this committee has seen me here before on a few occasions about this, where there's a number of years that pass between draft approval and final approval. Uh, there's a little bit of refinement in the lot fabric. Some of that is market driven, some of that is servicing driven. Uh, and that changes the lot fabric a little bit. And where we have, uh, such as in this case, we have a lot that's been dual zoned. As a result of that, it, the lot lines no longer line up with the zoning. Uh, the, there's a requirement for a zoning bylaw amendment. Uh, and in this case, we have a unique situation as well where there's a bit of a land swap uh, that'll be required for these lots to the south. Uh, you can see right now that they're bisected by this zone boundary, uh, and those lots are effectively dual zoned as well. Uh, where a lot is dual zoned, it has to meet the, the portion of the lot in each zone needs to meet the provisions of those zones. So we're seeking relief to reconfigure the zone boundary to line up with the lots. 
Um, and the third component is that we're looking to uh, lift the holding provision on stage three only. Now that's a technical requirement. You don't typically see that at planning committee, but uh, because of the stage that the final approval is at now, um, it's the applicant was requiring that holding provision lift now anyway. They're having to do the zoning by law anyway, so we're looking to, to capitalize on the two processes and get some efficiencies out of the system, out of the process. So this is the kind of the end goal of these, this application that's before the committee. Um, is this, this rezoning. So you can see that the, the idea is to lift the holding provision for stage three. Um, it's to reconfigure these zone boundaries a little bit uh, and to remove the lot, uh, minimum lot area and maximum lot coverage requirements to allow all of the lots to fit. So I've talked about this land swap a little bit uh, and I thought that that needs a little bit more clarification. Uh, so you can see on this uh, schedule here, this sort of zoom, zoom up, uh, that this thick line right here is the line that currently divides, it's currently a zone boundary that divides the Tamarack owned lands to the north uh, and the Bar Homes owned lands to the south. The Bar Homes lots are zoned R234, the Tamarack lots are zoned R242 and R241. So the developers, uh, sort of from an early stage, had planned these, this subdivision together uh, with the idea that this, the streets would run in this format and the lot fabric would be this way uh, and that ultimately there would have to be some, some land swapping to allow the lots to be developed. So the idea here is that Tamarack owns these lots here, in these, this, so this one full lot and then these three partial lots, uh, those would be conveyed to Bar Homes. Bar Homes owns these four sort of partial lots and they'll convey that to Tamarack. Uh, and the idea is that each developer would then be able to continue to develop those lots using the styles that they've been, they've been building in their communities. Uh, and so what we're seeking to do is just shift the zone boundary to uh, line up with those lot fabrics and, and allow that character to be maintained and continued in those, uh, on those streets. Looking a little bit at the official plan, uh, the subject site is in the Cataraqui West Secondary Plan, as I've said. Uh, phase three is designated low density residential, and then there's a strip of medium density residential on the right side of Holden Street. Uh, we've reviewed the, the change in lot fabric and the, the proposed lots and found that they do continue to conform to the density and built form requirements of the official plan. Uh, a more detailed review of the official plan uh, or the development against the official plan was done at an earlier stage as part of the draft plan process. So this won't affect that and the proposal continues to conform with the official plan. So if I can sum up, where this component, this zoning bylaw amendment has three major components. The first is to remove the minimum lot area and maximum lot coverage requirements. Uh, the second is to reconfigure the zone boundaries uh, and normalize them to match the lot fabric. And the third is to lift the holding provision from phase three, stage three only. Uh, it's, it's a proposal that's consistent with the PPS and with the secondary plan. Um, and with that, I'll invite uh, comments and questions from the planning committee and from the public through you, Madam Chair. Thank you, and could I hear from staff, please? Thank you, Madam Chair, through you. Um, public notice for this application was uh, provided in accordance with the uh, Planning Act. 193 properties were notified um, around the subject property. Signs were placed on the property, as well as a courtesy notice was uh, placed uh, on the Kingston wig. And uh, till date, no public correspondence has been received on this application. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Councillor Neal? Very quickly, the relief you're looking for for lot coverage and setback. Um, I'm trying to get my head around it looking at the maps. Uh, does that actually uh, improve density? Or will there be some oversized lots with less coverage, uh, because I know we're trying to, uh, with the urban boundaries being what they are, we're trying to ensure full development of existing properties. Uh, did that make sense? Uh, I think so, through you, Madam Chair. Uh, so I, I do want to clarify that we're seeking relief from the minimum lot area and the maximum lot coverage. Um, the with respect to the density, uh, the lot frontage requirement uh, is is another tool that the zoning bylaw has in place that that helps to regulate that density. And then combined with the yard setbacks, uh, those 
tools together allow the, the density to be regulated. The lot area is another tool that, that does that a little bit less effectively. Um, in this case, this revised lot fabric does result in a very slight decrease in density. I believe it's from 33.9 to 33.5 units per net hectare, but I would have to defer to my report for, for, for those exact figures. Uh, but the, in general, the, the amendment through to the zoning bylaw would not have a significant impact on that, and that density uh, is still very well within the uh, requirements of the secondary plan for Cataraqui West. Thank you. Any other? Oh, Councillor Turner. Thank you, and through you, Madam Chair. Um, so I'm just trying to wrap my brain around this. Can you tell me, in terms of lot sizes, are there lots that are going to be a lot smaller than other lots? Just is that what you're asking relief from? As I'm just basically. So there's going to be like maybe five lots that are going to be slightly smaller than other lots. So, thank you, through you, Madam Chair. So there are a few lots that are gonna be a little bit smaller, uh, and there's gonna be some variation in the lot fabric and the lot sizes. So you can see on this schedule here, I don't know if I can get any closer in, but there will be some variation in the lot size, and the lot area requirement is one that only applies to uh, single detached and semi-detached dwellings. It doesn't apply to road dwellings. So there's a few singles and semis here where the they'll be a little bit smaller than maybe their neighbors, but the difference in size is not, um, it's not significant. They'll still have the same frontage as, as all of their neighbors. They'll still be able to meet all of their lot, or their yard requirements. Uh, so they'll have all that amenity space that they need. Their driveways will still meet the, the re requirements of the zoning bylaw. So generally speaking, there will be some variation in lot size, but it won't be, it won't be a drastic difference uh, and certainly nothing that would uh, have an impact on servicing as well. Councillor Osanek. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a quick question about for those homes backing on to OS, which is Open Space 16. What is OS 16 again? Is that where there's um, a creek, so stormwater management going through there and those backyards back onto that? Do they? Through you, Madam Chair, that's correct. That OS 16 is a, is a fairly significant stormwater management feature, and I would defer to staff for clarification on, on how that ties into uh, any existing waterways, um, but the lots in the R241 zone, uh, that zone provides a slightly reduced rear yard than the rest of the R242 zone. It's, it's an, I believe it's six meters compared to uh, 7.5 or 7.25 for the rest of the subdivision. So they have a slightly reduced rear yard, but that um, OS 16 zone has a setback built in that requires uh, houses to be at least six meters away from the 100-year 100 100-year 100 floodplain line, which is itself well within that that uh, feature. So, if your if your question has a, if I guess if the gist of your question is that if there's any risk of flooding or anything like that, the I, that's been well considered through um, through the technical review and the setbacks in place will are intended to mitigate and prevent that. And Councillor Neal. Sorry, quick afterthought. Um, is this zoned that so that new development by right can have secondary suites? Uh, that might be a question for staff. But uh, would there be an intention to develop, like a lot of new developments, secondary suites as an option for the builders? Thank you through you, Madam Chair. This subdivision is located within the pilot project area that currently exists, so it would be possible. That's up to the developers to determine if they choose to proceed in that fashion. But we could encourage it. Yes. Thank you. Now I'd like to um, open this to the floor. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak to this application? I think you seeing none. Thank you very much for your, for your uh, presentation. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, with that I will close our third public meeting and I will open our fourth public meeting, which is um, to do with 672 Division Street, um, application for a zoning bylaw amendment. Okay. 
Thank you, council members, and good evening. My name is Stephanie Landon, and I'm here to represent Mr. Stephen Krause, owner of the property at 672 Division Street. We applied for a building permit on March 10th uh, this year to perform some extensive renovations due to a sewer backup. And to our great surprise, we were denied by the building inspector because apparently the building is zoned as a duplex and not a triplex building, and obviously not to our knowledge. Um, we are proposing to accommodate three parking spaces and have submitted drawings. I don't know if anybody has them, but I have them with me. And we have submitted our, um, let's specify this adjustment as two spaces in the driveway currently exist. We have also allotted for three bicycle parking spaces in the existing shed in the backyard. And I would also like to bring attention to the access of all units. There are two entrances in the building, um, one on the north side and one on the east side, and both entr entrances have proper walkways. In the report to planning committee, section 3.3.9 of the official plan, it requires satisfaction be met to items A through J. I can say with great confidence that all requirements minus E and H, which are not applicable, would most certainly meet the city's satisfaction. And in closing, I would like to say that we operate a well-maintained family-oriented home for our tenants and, up, and have upheld proper city standards and will continue to do so. So on behalf of myself and Mr. Krause, we are asking for your consideration and approval to amend the zoning from a duplex to a triplex residential building. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, could I hear from staff, please? Ms. Venditti. Thank you, through you, Madam Chair. Um, notice for this was provided in accordance with the Planning Act through signage on the property as well as a mail out to all landowners within 120 meters of the property and a courtesy notice in the WIG standard. There has been no public correspondence or input received to date based on this application. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Questions from the committee? Councillor Neal? Yes. Uh, I. Uh believe, having looked at the map, that I own property probably within 120 meters. Uh, sorry for the delay in, in making this declaration. I'll confirm that before uh, the final report comes, but uh, I live at 707 Al, I don't live, I own a property at 707 Alfred Street, where I used to live, and I think that's up at the top of the cliff. Uh, where your property is, I believe. I don't, think, I don't think I can see Alfred Street from up there, can I? Uh, in the winter when the leaves are oh. off the trees, we can. <laughs> so I, I know it'd be close to the 120 meters. So I'll step away, I'll fill out the form for now and I'll confirm that before a vote gets taken. So thank you, sorry. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Neal. Uh, any questions? And I'd like to open this uh, public meeting to members of the public. Mr. Dixon. Am I done? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I don't have any problems with what you're trying to do. You're in a little bit of a bureaucratic conundrum, uh, as you explain it. And the, there's no drawings in the report as I understand it, and you said you have some drawings here, but I'm wondering if, could you pre use the lamp on the clerk's desk to project them up onto the screen, or is the lamp operating right now? I will see what I can do. Um, you know, you know, just so we're able to follow what's going on. Um, I live, you know, a few blocks away, but I don't really know just what, what area you're sort of talking about, and. So you don't have a PowerPoint, but the clerk does have the lamp, so you could place your drawings right there and then put them up on the screen. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just for information purposes, the drawings are included in the agenda package on pages 103 through to 107.
they're not the uh, quite the usual ones that that you've seen before, but there there are drawings. In the interest of expediency, I don't think I'll be able to get the lamp running uh, in any time soon, so my apologies okay, for that. Okay, uh, then I, I have no problems with what you're trying to do then. I, I just wanted to, wanted to see it discussed sort of in the room, but I guess they're there and that's fine. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other comments? Yes, sir. You're on. Yeah. Hi, my name is uh, Andrew Emerson. I live at 2233 Paul Boulevard. Uh, and I own the property uh, beside the property in question. Um, I unfortunately haven't seen the map, so I'm at a, at a bit of a loss as to where the, uh, the location of the, the driveway is going to be. Um, and I apologize that I didn't get that information. There's, there seems to be two issues here. The one is the, the zoning bylaw changed to allow um, three units in the building, and then the other um, item is the, the parking lot expansion. Is the parking lot a prerequisite of the uh, zoning change, or can you get the zoning change without putting the parking lot in? Well, I'd, like to, I'd like to understand that. Um, so we're, uh, where am I looking at? Thank you, you Madam Chair. Um, with respect to the driveway, there is no change proposed with respect about the driveway. Everything will remain the same. The property as it is already has a very long existing driveway that can accommodate the parking spaces and there's already parking on the property for the three. Okay, that's what I was confused about because it's increased the amount of lot area in the rear yard that may be used for parking, three vehicles. The existing property is in the A zone, which is a one and two family zone, which has provisions in the zoning bylaw that limits the amount of space that can be used to a maximum of 40 square meters, which is the equivalent of two parking spaces. So zoning relief is required to permit the third parking space for the third unit to bring the property. Okay, so there's parking. no um, physical construction going to be done at the parking lot? No. Okay, when I read this, I thought that you were going to... I know, it's a bit confusing. I thought you were going to cut into the backyard and, and put parking in there. So there's no changes to the, no. To the driveway at all. No? Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> it's great. That's the way we like to hear it. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who wish to speak to this application? Any other questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. And I'll close our fourth public meeting, and I will open our fifth public meeting, which is uh, a City of Kingston non-statutory public meeting regarding public participation in the planning approval process, and Ms. Eusebio will introduce this. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of Planning Committee, members of staff, and members of the community. My name is Anne-Marie Eusebio, and for this public meeting tonight, I'm going to present information on the public participation in the planning approvals process. So the city would like to ensure that there are opportunities for the public to provide meaningful feedback on applications that are presented at planning committee meetings. So um, th there was a council motion that was passed in March 2016, which required staff to look at enhanced uh, engagement opportunities and to look at uh, other municipal approaches. Um, we also did some research and uh, we would like to present some options that may be used to enhance public participation at specific stages of the planning approvals process. Uh, the city, uh, as you know, is currently undertaking work for other city projects, which include Bill 73, procedural changes, specifically with respect to creating a planning advisory committee, as well as the preparation of a public engagement framework, which will further elevate the ways in which the public is able to participate. 
So the consultation that we have conducted to date um, is that we uh, conducted three focus group sessions that were held on April 3rd, 2017. And the participants included members of the development community as well as various members of the public. And those who are interested in participating were required to register with the city online. The participants were requested to provide information or comments on the city's current planning approvals process and related service standards, the format of statutory public meetings and related signage, and alternative options for inviting the public to comment on an application's land use merits. So this is a slide which shows the city's planning approval process, an example uh, for zoning bylaw amendments. As you know, the city also has um, planning and building uh, service standards. And as you know, these came out of the mayor's task force and they're intended to provide uh, greater delivery of services to the public. So in going through um, this process here, uh, the applicant uh, would meet with city staff the applicant would submit a complete application to the city. This application would be circulated to technical reviewers with the appropriate supporting documentation. Uh, technical reviewers would provide comments. And then there would be a statutory public meeting held at planning committee. At this time, there would already have been um, a notice of complete application, signage posted, as well as a notice of a public meeting 20 days before the statutory public meeting. There would then be um, the application or the plans may have been revised based on any technical review and subsequent circulations may have been made. And then the uh, application would be presented at the comprehensive report stage at planning committee. After that, city council would make a decision to approve or refuse the application and then the bylaw would be in full force or of effect or there could be an appeal to the Ontario Municipal Board. So the topic of um, conversation or discussion today is public participation. And this is really at, as you know, at the um, statutory public meeting stage held at planning committee and at the comprehensive report stage. So at the statutory public meeting stage, full participation is provided where the applicant presents, the committee can pose questions and the public can speak for a maximum of five minutes and also submit uh, written comments. Um, at the comprehensive uh, report stage, however, uh, the public is not allowed to speak, but they submit written comments. So the, we have received uh, concerns from the public that um, they have a concern with uh, full part participation not being provided, um, that they are not able to speak um, about a planning application, especially at the uh, final design stage where there may be a re there's a recommendation to a planning committee. So we are currently um, looking into this and um, that will be reviewed in relation to the Planning Act, um, this process, as well as the existing service standards. So we've uh, looked at how other municipalities support public uh, participation, particularly after the statutory, uh, the statutory public meeting. And we found that nearly half of the 15 municipalities have established time limits for speaking, uh, for the public to speak. Um, five municipalities require pre-registration in some form of the delegation, oral submission, deputation, and or presentation. So this is a chart which shows uh, the 15 municipalities that we've surveyed. We have on the left of the columns here, the statutory public meetings, and then to your right, you have the comprehensive report meetings. And then you see um, how staff, the applicant and public participates, and also the time limits um, that are issued. Um, where there is a dashed line, uh, those municipalities um, do a combined meeting where there is a statutory public meeting as well as a, recomm a recommendation report through the comprehensive uh, report stage. So you, you see here that on the right hand portion here for comprehensive report meetings, you see that um, the applicant and the public um, has to register uh, with the clerk uh, with regards to uh, public participation. So based on uh, the research that we have conducted, uh, we have developed um, a few options. And uh, the intent of these options is to provide the public with uh, meaningful uh, opportunities for meaningful input on planning applications at the later stages of the planning approvals process, particularly after the statutory public meeting. So the first option is unlimited registered delegations at the comprehensive support. Uh, comprehensive report stage. So this option would um, allow unlimited time for the public to speak on planning applications. 
Um, the benefit of uh, this approach is that uh, the members of the public would be able to speak about an application at the comprehensive report stage when a recommendation is being made, and that they would able, be able to comment um, on the final design of a project. Uh, the second option is uh, unlimited, uh, unlimited uh, delegations at the statutory public meeting and also the comprehensive report stage. In this case, uh, there would be a limited amount of time uh, for the public to speak. And uh, the benefit of this uh, approach is that there would be equal opportunity for members of the public to speak on an application. The third option is uh, allowing for a second mandatory public meeting. In this case, there would be no option to speak when the comprehensive report is on the floor. So this particular option would apply to all applications, those that are complex and those are, that are um, more straightforward, such as a secondary suite uh, zoning bylaw amendment application. So in this case, um, there could be extra costs incurred by the applicants, um, questions with regards to staffing resources to be considered as well. Um, and the fourth option would be other. So we are welcome, um, if, are the, if there are any other viable options to consider, uh, we would certainly um, welcome uh, that feedback as well. So in our research, we also looked at the review of signage. So we are looking at ways to improve the city's existing signage with regards to statutory public meetings and notices for complete applications. And we have received comments from the public that the signage is difficult to understand, that uh, there's too much technical um, text, um, and they're lacking details such as location mapping and that sort of thing. So this is what we see in terms of our notices for public meetings. So we have the purpose of effect on the signage, so that could be to permit a secondary unit within an existing dwelling, the address, uh, the file number, um, the date and time of the public meeting, and also um, directing uh, members of the public to our Development and Services Hub um, website, our online services um, online. So we did look at other municipalities as well um, to see how uh, they present uh, their signage in terms of their development applications. So this is an example of the City of Toronto, and this shows a development application that was submitted to amend an official plan and zoning bylaw to allow a residential mixed-use building. So on this signage, we see um, the proposed building highlighted. Uh, we see the massing and scale of the building, and we also see uh, the surrounding buildings as well as they relate. Um, what's also provided in this sign is the district and ward, the site address, applicant information, uh, as well as um, quick response code, which directs members of the public um, to obtain further information about the planning application. Information with regards to the community planner who is managing the file is also provided. Uh, this is an example for uh, the city of Brampton. Uh, it's a notice for an official plan amendment uh, to redesignate from neighborhood retail to district retail and stormwater management ponds. And in this example, we see a, um, a proposal. We see the, the property boundaries there, and we also see um, uh, bu building footprints of the surrounding area. We also see uh, a general line um, where uh, the public can contact uh, staff with regards to this project. So that's signage. Um, so when, when we look at um, improving public participation within the planning approvals process, we look at our existing planning approval process, we look at our servicing standards, we've taken the research, um, we've presented it to you with regards to signage as well as um, other municipal approaches. So we will consider any feedback that we receive tonight and from that, uh, we will prepare a comprehensive report to planning committee with a recommendation and then present uh, the recommendation to council. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions from the committee? Councillor Neal. Thank, thank you for the report. That's very, very helpful. Um, is it possible to make this available, distribute it to community and neighborhood associations? Because I know there's been some expression of, of concern. Uh, and this is an excellent document, I believe. So that can be done, great. Um, I guess a major frustration that we heard from the public was the fact that 
we, we front-ended the statutory public meetings. And uh, sometimes it's months, in some cases years, before the comprehensive report comes to us and then goes on to, to, uh, to council. I know the Walmart, for instance, which fell through anyway, but the Walmart in the North End was four years between statutory public meeting and the comprehensive report. And often, the comprehensive report reflects a lot of changes from the statutory public meeting. So, and we appear on the chart to be the only municipality that doesn't allow public input at comprehensive report meetings. So I'm, I'm hopeful that that, in fact, can be remedied because some people were of the opinion that we were not in compliance with the Planning Act because we didn't allow that later uh, in public input in the comprehensive report. So I'm looking forward to those, those changes. And again, thank you for uh, a very good report. I appreciate it. Any other questions from the committee? I've got a couple. Um, the, um, is uh, are two public meetings mandated by the province? Uh, a, a public meeting uh, at the, is, is it mandated to have a public meeting at the comprehensive report? time or is it up, is it uh, the city can decide? Thank you and through you Madam Chair. So it, it is not a legislated um, requirement under the Planning Act. The statutory public meeting there is one that's required unless there are substantial changes to the application and then a second one can be warranted. It's at the municipality's discretion under section 3417 I believe. Um, but it is a best practice, and that's what we've learned from our research, is that it's not that the municipality hasn't been consistent with legislative requirements in the past, it's that we've met those requirements, but other municipalities have had additional pieces added into their public process so that they exceed the legislative requirements more as a best practice, and that's what we're aiming to achieve through some of these proposed changes. Thank you, and another one is a follow-up on the 120 days, because that is legislated, that we have to make a decision in 120 days. So how would um, staff handle it if at the comprehensive report, and we were closing in on the 120 days, but with the public speaking, items came up that the committee would want to change the comprehensive report. Um, how would how would we handle that? Because I think that would have to be part of uh, this report. Yes, and thank you, and through you. So we have been talking internally about what type of um, procedure we would need to put in place because as part of um, having additional comments or um, questions or concerns that are identified at the comprehensive report stage, at that point in time, the committee has the report before them with staff's recommendation. So essentially what we talked about doing um, and working with the clerk's department is a very similar process to the one that we've been using with Heritage Kingston over the last year, and that we would be looking at if there was substantial feedback that came as a result of um, public submissions at the time of comprehensive report, staff would be picking that up in a supplementary report that would get pulled through to council on the adds. So it's it's a piece that would, would capture all of that. In terms of the 120 days, that's a legislative requirement that just sets um, a benchmark period of time. Um, it, it's not often that we get appeals based on, on timing alone because it's always in the best interest of the applicant to continue to work with the city through to a recommendation and ideally a supporting decision um, from council on any situation. Um, even in the event of an appeal, it's, it's a better situation to be in to have a, a staff recommendation on your side. So I'm not terribly worried about that. It definitely could create a situation where um, members of council on planning committee may want to look at making amendments to the staff recommendation that's brought onto the floor as part of planning committee. 
from our research, what we've come to understand in other municipalities, how they've handled that is typically the committee takes a, a short recess so that staff can fully contemplate that and make sure that um, if there's an amendment that's being suggested that we can ensure that it, it's done so in a way that we're not creating um, any type of administrative error or potential issue. Um, and then sometimes a deferral that could be uh, something that would be an outcome of, of having some additional public input. But I think that we feel that by having the statutory public meeting at the beginning of the process and encouraging people to work with us the entire way that hopefully by the time you get to comprehensive report, you really shouldn't be hit, hearing a lot of net new things that haven't been fully considered by staff. It hopefully would be only in the exception. Thank you, and one other thing that came up um, tonight actually was, would there be a plan to make some of the language a little easier to understand for members of the public so that when they come, they, they can actually can understand what the, the parking means and that sort of thing. Do we have to have them written the way they are now or do we have the ability to um, make them a little more understandable for the layman? In terms of the actual public notices that they receive or? Um, they are reports. The reports. Mm -hmm. In I terms of the confusion about the parking that happened today. It's a I know I didn't give no, this No, no, no. It's a valid so. question, and I'm just trying to figure out how to tactfully answer it. It's something that as planners we're aware of that sometimes we can be too technical. And um, it is something that we're continuously endeavoring to improve upon having plainly written reports that are easily understood. So um, we don't exactly have a specific plan to address that, but we are aware of the concern, and it is something that we're endeavoring to do on a regular basis on top of looking at educational opportunities for the public that we can offer through sessions at planning committee. And we've done several of those so far, um, briefings where we're, we're talking about different things, but it is something that we're committed to doing and through more information being available through our website and other means as well, we're hoping that all those things in combination can help um, the public to, to feel comfortable with the planning language and really understand what we're talking about when we're talking about a zoning or official plan or what have you. And um, I would say that's our strategy, unless the commissioner has any other comments on that. That's great to hear. Thank you. I'll just, uh, Councillor Osanek. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, for those cities that um, where you have to register in order to speak, do we know how they deal with a cutoff period? Like, is it right at the start of the meeting or is it like the day before, how they handle what the cutoff would be? Uh, thank you, and through you, Madam Chair. Municipalities do it differently. Um, some would follow a very similar process to what we would have um, for council delegations and, and contacting the clerk's department in advance and registering. Um, some may just do it officially through the door coming in and then cut it off at a certain point. There, there's different approaches that have been taken depending on the city. Okay, thank you. And um, do we, can we also give our, our opinion? Yeah, okay. So for the options that were presented, those um, three options, I'd be okay with, uh, with number two, but with, um, with a maximum time, but I think five minutes is too short, so I would go for a maximum of 10 minutes. And I don't really like the registration idea because sometimes people find out about the public meetings at the very last minute and then rush to City Hall that day, and if the cutoff period was yesterday, then that's not really fair. I don't think that's too inclusive. And then as far as the signs go, I do think a picture is worth a thousand words, and so I do like the Toronto sign, and I also like how they have that proposed summary, just using those symbols of what the just rate right, of the application is, and I do like the picture idea too. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Neal? Uh, just to follow up to the comment about length of time. I know in the past, because we haven't, it's been a kind of uh, courtesy announcement that we should stick to five minutes, but it hasn't been part of that. But we have, I think, many times recognized in more complex proposals and given people a second opportunity to speak after the five minutes. I know you've done that and previous chairs have done that. Would, if we made it a five minute rule, would it be like uh, at council where we could 
waive the rule with two thirds of the committee to allow uh, people a second opportunity if it's a very complex issue, which we do informally now. Uh, thank you and through you, Madam Chair. Absolutely, it's something that we can write in as part of implementing these changes. Because they're not statutory in nature, we're not doing any type of um, official uh, bylaws for our, our processes, but what we do have to look at is the actual mandate of the committee and how it speaks to timing in that piece. So it is something that we could look at incorporating in um, to ensure, and I believe in, in the absence, and, and Derek, you can... Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, in the absence of it being spoken to in the committee bylaw, it defers to the overall council bylaw, which outlines that process anyway, unless I'm, um, I'm incorrect. No, you're correct in that there is specifically the committee bylaw. If it's not addressed within the committee bylaw, then it does defer to the council procedural bylaw. Thank you, and through you. Um, I would just like to offer my opinion on the um, time limit. I, I think I'd like to stick to the five minute rule and if we had a very complex issue, I agree with Councillor Neal that we could possibly allow people to speak at the end of the rotation. But I, I think 10 minutes would be, just my opinion, is, is, is a long time to give a full room. Um, but anyway, that's my opinion, thank you. Thank you. Other questions? I will um, open the meeting to the public. Mr. Dixon. Uh, th thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for the report and the presentation. Uh, very high standard um, of work that's been done. Um, and I also want to praise the fact that the city has shown, um, I think, major improvement in how it's been handling the, the public process overall in the last couple of years, um, to the point where it now has a specialized report that's already come forward and it's in the process of being um, debated um, on its overall strategy of community consultation. So that's great to see. Um, I think you were responding to public input on how you were interacting with the public on that. So that's, that's excellent. Um, And I think uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll put on some more praise before I get into some like critique. Um, I think during the, the official plan process, we really saw um, staff responding to the public's desire to become involved at a, a deep level. So that led to the process being extended and expanded. So again, I'm very pleased to see that. Now, um, I've got a little bit of a concern. Uh, I'm just gonna raise one example. We, we've been going through the visioning for the former Kingston Penitentiary and the Portsmouth Harbor um, project. And I see on the agenda that the next stage is coming to council on Tuesday. Just looking at the report online earlier today. And that has been a combined consultation process. Like we're partnering with the federal government and the city of Kingston, right? And I took part in some of the sessions on that and I was frustrated to a certain extent um, because it wasn't the same as the way the city does it on its own, for which I generally have high, high praise with some reservations. But I, I, I'm just confused in terms of, say, whose rules apply on the consultation methods, right? We have our own civic, and then we have a, a federal partnership in this case, and it seemed that our maybe more intensive uh, debate and discussion was being trumped. Sorry, I shouldn't use that word. It was being um, maybe... Um, Overtaken might be a better word, um, used instead of, right? So don't want to get into discussion of that uh, specifically, but what I would have preferred with that report would be to see it come here first, come to the planning committee first and have public feedback at that stage. Now, I know that there's public feedback coming. Um, at the most recent session, I know that um, 
the, the uh, staff were talking about what is to come on that report, right? There's many more steps that will have public input still to come, so. Okay, if I could just go to the five minute uh, limit. Um, what I remember at, at one stage was um, a member of the community, Rob Fonger, had a PowerPoint presentation uh, he prepared and put a lot of time into. And he was frustrated with the five minute limit and his work wound up being basically wasted. No one could really understand. He kept jumping around trying to get it all in, right? And he's a retired planner himself. He really had a lot to offer, but was frustrated by that. So that's something to keep in mind. I think most of the time the five minutes is good. If you break it up though, you're breaking up the, like you have five and then a five later, you're breaking up the flow of that person. So it's a tricky one to, to get it right. Um, now, going back to Bill 73, when that was presented um, to planning committee, I believe me a couple of years ago now, in its process of going through Queen's Park, and it's now been uh, finished there, one of the items that really interested me as, as a possibility of what Bill 73 was going to offer was an actual public member of the planning committee being discussed. Now, I'm not sure if that made it into the final bill uh, at Queen's Park or if it's been adopted elsewhere in Ontario. Now, that may be a question uh, to ask for because um, I think the planning committee does, does an excellent job. There's a tremendous workload on the committee and also on staff. So I think Kingston is doing well. And then my final suggestion, and I, I've discussed this with the clerk, and I'm, I'm planning on putting it forward in writing. I'm not sure quite where it should go, if it goes here or admin policies, or I'm a little sure on the bureaucracy, but if you look at the agenda online for city meetings, you have a various JPG files on, say, certain reports, right? If you go online and you see those, and you can download those if you want online. Then we have all kinds of public letters that come in as official correspondence, right? Letters from members of the community or their various governor's organizations. And what I'm offering is a suggestion for a facility to be developed to be able to download those through a JPG file online. That is an official correspondence letter. You can get that through the clerk's office, right? You gotta go through a procedure to get it. If, if anyone writes in, you can obtain that letter. But you can't directly download it the same way that you can for a JPG file that's part of an agenda for a council meeting or a meeting of the committee. So I'm just offering that suggestion for the first time and you'll be hearing it again uh, from me. And I'll just conclude by uh, thanking uh, you and uh, your colleagues for the report. Thank you. Um, there are no other members of the public, so. Would anyone like to respond? Thank you, and through you, um, thank you for your, your comments and suggestions, Mr. Dixon. I think the one question that I heard in there was, um, and perhaps Commissioner Hurdle will speak to um, some of the comments related to the Kingston Penitentiary POH visioning um, process as she's been one of the key leaders uh, for the city in that process. Um, as it relates to Bill 73, we did bring a report um, about a year ago when um, the legislation came through and received royal assent, and we've been going through the process. There were a lot of changes that were brought in with that legislation, one of the components being a requirement to have um, some type of member of the public um, in a position whether it's through a planning committee, whether it's through another standing committee of council, it was there was a lot of flexibility there, or whether it was by another means that the municipality deemed appropriate. So my team has been working um, through that process as well as all the other changes in legislation that we need to be compliant with. We will be bringing a, a specific report forward that deals with the Bill 73 changes and what our recommendations are related to that public spot, and I believe it's going to council. Uh, the first meeting in September because it has to deal with creation of a new committee that doesn't exist. It actually goes to council instead of planning committee. So that will be forthcoming in September. And I'll leave the remainder of the comments to Commissioner Hurdle. 
Thank you, and through Madam Chair, I, I understand that we will have a full discussion, I'm sure, on the Kingston Penitentiary and uh, Portsmouth Olympic Harbor visioning uh, next week. So I'm not certainly gonna get into all those details. Um, but it is a partnership that the city did establish. It's a partnership that is actually with uh, Correctional Services, Fisheries and Ocean, and uh, they are both represented by Canada Lands, who has been the lead on this particular uh, consultation process. So the consultants were hired directly by Canada Lands and not by the City of Kingston. So this wasn't a City of Kingston hired consultant and process. The City of Kingston was a partner because the City of Kingston owns a small portion actually of the entire site. Most of the, um, the site, as Council's aware, is owned by uh, different uh, federal departments. So it, the, um, the approach that's been taken in terms of consultation from the federal government is quite different than the approach that they usually take for their disposal. And I think that uh, we should actually be quite pleased that there has been so much um, outreach in terms of um, to the public over the last year because it is a process that lasted about a year. And it's a process that was also outlined from the very beginning to the public as far as the different steps and when the public would be involved and engage and how they would be engaged. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any further questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much for your presentation. And with that, I will close our final public meeting and call our regular meeting to order and ask for approval of the agenda. Councillor Neal, Councillor Turner seconds. All those in favor? That's carried. Uh, confirmation of the minutes of Thursday, June the 8th. Councillor Neal, signed by Councillor Turner. All those in favor? And that's carried. And Thursday, June the 15th minutes. We will also be Councillor Osanic, Councillor Turner seconds. All those in favor? Thank you. Um, and we do have a disclosure of pecuniary interest that was uh, entered a little earlier. Uh, no delegations. We've had some briefings, but not right now. And we have one uh, piece of business, application official plan amendment, zoning bylaw amendment 193 resource road. And we do have a recommendation from staff for approval. Moved by Councillor Osanic, seconded by Councillor McLaren. Any comments or questions? And I'll call the question. All those in favor? And that carries. No motions, notices, motions, other business. One piece of correspondence from Mr. Dixon. Next meeting, August 3rd. Motion to adjourn. Councillor Neal, Councillor Osanic seconds. All those in favor. Thank you very much.